Hi, welcome. We are Thomas and Shanna Ritter. This is day one of our Goldilocks Zone Contact Challenge. We called it Goldilocks Zone because it's about riding a horse on the bit and what that means and what it looks like. And of course, there's always this Goldilocks Zone between the horse being above the bit and being behind the bit. And we want to explain a little bit uh, what that's about. And uh, as a spoiler alert, it's not just about the head position. It's it has nothing to do with a bit, actually. It's the same with so, bitless bridle. Yeah, if you ride bitless, this all yeah. applies. It doesn't matter. It's about how the whole body works as a holistic system. Right. Where you're going to talk about the biomechanics. We're going to talk about the rider's seat and, mm -hmm. and influence as well. Because, of course, obviously, that has a big influence. And we're going to talk about how all of the body parts are working together. So people often just look at the head and neck, and that's important, but it's not the only important component. There's the hind legs, the back, and how it's all working together. So we're going to look at all of that. So before we get started, I wanted to first take a quick moment and thank you for the amazing response and interest we have had in this challenge. Particularly, I wanted to thank all of you who took the time to email me with your own experiences, what you struggle with, what your questions are, and what your experiences have been with trying to find the Goldilocks zone of correct contact. And for those of you who would like to join us for our 2024 Contact and Connection course running March 29th to July 11th, 2024, at the end of this challenge on day three, we will be sharing with you the details of the course and you can see if this is something that interests you and you would like to attend. So with that, let's get into today's topic. So today we're going to talk about above the bit. Now, again, it has nothing to do with the bit, just so you know. Tomorrow on day two, we're going to talk about behind the bit. And on day three, we'll talk about on the bit. In other words, correct classical contact, whether you have a bit or not. So, Thomas, let's do this. Yeah, so when I was, was young and started to ride, there were two, two big issues I was struggling with. One was sitting the trot, learning to sit the trot, and the other one was riding the horse on the bit. It's probably the same for everybody, I would, I would assume. It took me years to figure it out because my teachers didn't really explain it much. And they, they didn't really explain what on the bit meant. It was sort of assumed that everybody knows. And uh, it boiled down to people thinking, well, if the neck is round and the nose is vertical, the horse is on the bit. But turns out it's not really true. <laughs> the horse may or may not be on the bit if, you know, if the neck is round and the nose is on the vertical vertical, there's other factors yet that are more important, actually. So we'll talk about those in, in this challenge. And uh, when I studied the whole history of dressage and, and biomechanics and so on, I, I found out that the interpretation of what on the bit means actually changed quite a bit over the century. There was a time when the horse's nose 45 degrees in front of the vertical was considered still on the bit. That was in the yeah, 1830s, uh, the Prussian Cavalry Instruction Manual. And then there were always riders who said the nose has to be vertical and then anything in between vertical and, and 45 degrees in front of the vertical. Different authors had different ideas. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the, the interesting things that you find early on is that the old masters found out that if the rain aid approaches the, the jaw at a 90 degree angle, that's when the, the rain aids are most effective, that they come through most effectively. And of course, whether you have a bit or whether you ride bitless and the bridge of the nose is the point of contact that doesn't really make any difference. It's, it's really the same. But so I thought it was interesting because when I was young, I, I assumed that on the bit always, you know, meant, you know, the nose is pretty much vertical, but historically there's been a huge you know development a huge range of postures that were considered on the bit at various times and you can see it when you look at videos you know from the 1920s on you know so there you can you can see a whole range of postures and frames in the upper level riders and olympic riders which is which is an interesting thing to look at but so to, today you know we want to talk about above the bit and we'll look at a few examples of that and the important thing you know when you discuss contact and whether the horse is on the bit above the bit behind the bit whatever against the bit is not so much where the head and neck are mm -hmm. it plays a role but it's not the, the big factor the, the main factor is really how the forces of the hind legs are transmitted through the spine 
you know, from one end of the horse to the other and whether they are recycled back to the starting point or not. Right? And so there's, if everything goes well, the energy arrives in the front undiminished. You feel it in the reins, regardless of whether you have a bitless bridle or a bit. And uh, if things are less than optimal, then you lose some of that um, impulse from the hind legs, either because there's a mus muscle blockage, which is a little bit like a landslide covering a road and then the traffic is stopped, right? Or there could be a hypermobile area, which we call false bends in the um, yeah, traditional terminology. And th those are like big sinkholes where your car disappears if you're driving to them. <laughs> or uh, if you have a hole in the garden hose and then the water exits through the hole and then there's not much coming out at the front through the nozzle. So those are the, the two big options, you know, and uh, they, these leaks and these blockages can be caused by the rider, they can be caused by confirmation, they can be caused by crookedness, loss of balance, etc. So you, know, you always have to look at the balance and the straightness, the rider seed, and how do the bones of the horse kind of pass on the movement, you know, from the hind legs all the way to the skull, and then hopefully also back through the reins and the rider seed back to the hind legs. And yeah, when the horse is above the bit, then typically, you know, the back is dropped and the croup is up and the hind legs are often not under the body, either out behind or off to one side. So they're not flexing, they're not supporting the body mass. Mm -hmm. And if the hind legs are not supporting the body mass, they're not protecting the back, which is why the back collapses, you know, especially if the rider sits heavily. It becomes hollow. Right. And when the back drops, then the head comes up, you know, the underneck comes out and then the horse engages or braces the underneck. And usually they, they lock up in the pole too when, when the head is too high. Then it's just this, you know, sort of the bracing defensive posture that the horse doesn't fall down. <laughs> so, and you know, old masters used to say that balance and suppleness are the cornerstones of dressage. Yeah. And to, to me, that was always a profound statement because everything seems to come back to that. You know, uh, straightness is a part of balance, it's the lateral mm -hmm. balance. And uh, suppleness, you know, if the horse is supple and you have a connection from the hind legs to the pelvis to the spine, vertebra by vertebra, all the way to the other end. And the aids go and through and you have a circle of aids intact. So the energy flows through as it should and the aids exactly. flow through as yeah, they should. Exactly. And if you lose yeah. balance or if the horse gets crooked, then they have to brace with their muscles. So you lose the suppleness and then the energy transmission breaks down and then you'll feel it in the rain. Mm -hmm. You know, something will go right wrong with the rain contact, whether it's above the bid, below the bid, against the bid, or heavy on one rein and not in the other. You know, there's always going to be a, a repercussion in the rein contact when the balance is lost, or when the horse gets crooked, or when the uh, yeah, suppleness relaxation is lost. So, and now we'll look at some examples of that. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, so we're going to take a look at some videos from YouTube. These are just public use videos. I wanted to first say that these are average riders, just like most of you. They are doing the very best job they can. <clears throat> so we're not here to pick on them. Hopefully, maybe if they find this video, something we say is actually helpful to them. That would be really nice, but we are not picking on these riders at all. They are very representative of many of the problems that come up, so. Yeah, very, that's very important what Jana is saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've made all these mistakes that you see here and I struggled with the same thing. I think everybody goes through this yeah. phase that we're not trying to make them look bad or anything. It's just part of the journey that, I mean, in the beginning, you don't quite know how to do things. And often trainers don't tell the students really how to do a better job or how to get there faster, and more you, efficiently. And you can't yeah. start writing yeah, right. perfect, knowing everything. Exactly. It's just not possible. So. Yeah. You're going to make mistakes and struggle along the way, and that's really yeah. normal. So if that's you, mm. <laughs> you're in good company. Yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. And yeah, we want to take these examples to maybe point out energy transmission or where energy gets blocked in the body. And sometimes you can see connections between the seat of the rider and what the horse is doing. And so it's, it, it's always interesting to look at the sort of the biomechanical aspects. So it's just a test, intra-level test, right? And uh, what you can see in all of these is that these horses and riders are still struggling with the balance, and that's normal. 
in the early stages. And here you could see the horse starts tossing the head just before the turn, right? And if you, I always look at which hind leg is on the ground when stuff like that happens. And it's, it's the left hind leg here. It's going to be the outside hind leg in the turn, right? See there. That shows you that there is a lack of connection from that hind leg to the ground and to the weight for whatever reason. Most horses have one hind leg that's a little harder to connect, has something to, to do with crookedness. Sometimes it has to do with the rider. I see, and this is, this is sort of a trickle down effect that the, the rider now is kind of trying to bend the horse right because she's about to turn right. And she clearly, of course, she knows the horse is not in, in the best balance for this. Um, and then what's interesting is, see, she rides that corner, the horse becomes a little rounder because now she is able to put some weight on that right hind leg. Right? So when the left hind leg loses the connection to the ground and it just pushes and pushes the croup up, then it doesn't support long enough for the right hind leg to come far enough under the body to be able to really flex and then that is sort of a domino effect a little bit. The one hind leg isn't doing what it's supposed to do, then the other hind leg can't do what it's supposed to do, and then sometimes it escalates a, a little bit. And then here with that turn, these turns often have the effect of straightening the horse because now if the shoulder was, was drifting maybe to the to the left and you ride the right turn, then that helps to straighten the horse. And then as the horse is in better balance and, and straighter, now the right hind leg can support the body mass better than it could on the straight line. And so as a result, the horse gets a little bit rounder again. Mm -hmm. On the bit. Right. Yeah. Or closer. Closer. Exactly. Yeah. It's often. In the ballpark. Yeah, exactly. It's a continuum oftentimes, right? So. And uh, so here's the circle. You can, you can see that there's a beneficial effect of the, the circles because it always forces the rider to use the outside aids <laughs> to turn the shoulder, right? Sometimes that's the whole trick that you uh, get the, the rider to use the outside knee and rein to turn the shoulder and then you have more weight on the outside hind leg. <clears throat> oh yeah, here in the, in the corner there is a bit of a wobble too, right? And it's again when the left hind leg is on the ground and it's the outside hind and it's this so it was good for the first half of the of the corner, right? In the second half, something happened here. Um, the old masters of the 19th century, like Louis Sego, for example, they already talk about how the quality of your turn depends on how well you can well, control the outside hind leg, right? So if the horse steps well underneath with the outside hind and flexes that, that has an anchoring supporting function, and then you can engage the inside hind and then the horse can stay on the bit. And if you lose that outside hind for some reason, then uh, yeah, the horse will drop the back and, and invert here. It's much better. Right? So yeah, there's moments that are decent, right? right. And exactly. that's, the, that's the thing that everyone struggles yeah. with. It's not that the horse always is above the bit or behind the yeah. bit or anything. It's, it's that the horse fluctuates quite a bit and right. it's hard to find this consistency. Yeah. So and this is interesting too. So it's a half vaulted to the right, half vaulted to the left. And anytime you change direction or you change gait or you change the line that you're riding, the balance of the horse has to be adjusted, which means those are moments that are vulnerable to things falling apart, which you then see in the rain contact and you feel it in the rain contact. So here that change of direction starts really well. The horse is good until here. All right. And here, the horse goes above the bit, right? And it's, again, it's the, the, the outside hind. In this case, it's the right hind. Somehow lost the, the connection to the ground, and the horse is kind of falling a little bit into the circle, into the vault, it seems, with the inside shoulder, right? So it, it's, it seems like the horse maybe has issues with keeping the outside hind connected. A lot of horses are like that. Sometimes it's just one hind leg when it's on the outside, then it, in that case, it's a crookedness issue. If it's both hind legs, then it could be that the rider doesn't half hold into the outside hind enough before turns or before the change of direction. <clears throat> so that, that's why you know, in, in the traditional you know, German riding instruction, you always told that you half hold the outside rein when the outside hind is on the ground. 
before turns and before changing direction and so on. And that's the reason you need the anchor of your outside hind leg so the horse stays balanced and is able to bend and then they, they can stay through the back and on the bit. And if you lose that connection to the outside hind, then the horse might lean into the turn and they might, uh, you know, sometimes they speed up and they drop the back and they invert and, and so on. So it's, it's interesting to, mm -hmm. to, see, to see it happening. It's, it's sort of applied physics, really. You know? And you can see, again, there are good moments. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's why we're not picking apart this or being <clears throat> needed. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's just there are moments that where you can tell the horse and rider yeah. are struggling. Yeah. And it's, it's actually, I like rides like that where there are good moments where uh, the horse is on the bit, everything's going well, and then there are moments where the horse inverts, something happens, and then you can compare, like, what's the difference between the good moments and the bad moments? Like, what line was the rider riding? You know, how was she sitting? How was she aiding? What was the horse doing? And then you often see patterns, you know, that certain moments are more vulnerable than others. And, <clears throat> so could you talk a little bit for them what above the bit really means? Why we're calling it above the bit or why it's traditionally called that? Um, that's a good question. Most people, when they talk about above the bit, they, they refer to the horse lifting the head too far. And then um, remember I said in the beginning that, that the old masters like Renaissance, Baroque, discovered that when the rain contact <laughs> touches the jaw at a 90 degree angle, that's when the rain aids go through the best. And the horse is really the least able to resist. But if the horse lifts the head and neck, then of course that is a very different <clears throat> angle between the rain and the nose. And then the horse can start bracing with the under neck and he can brace in the pole. And also the, the more the horse lifts the neck, the more they will drop the back. The, the, lift, withers, the, the withers in the back withers will in drop. The back, yes, yeah. exactly. Because there's weight and leverage in the horse's head and neck. And so the, the more the horse lifts the head, the more downward pressure there'll be behind the withers. And if everything goes well on an advanced horse that's really supple and strong, then the downward pressure of the elevated head and neck will be passed on to the hind legs and the hind legs will fold, they will flex. Mm -hmm. So the horse is collected, but if the hind legs are not flexing under the weight for whatever reason, then all that weight gets stuck in the back under the rider's seat. And if the horse doesn't have the strength yet, yeah. that's why you don't over-elevate the young right. horse. Mm -hmm. They don't have the strength to handle that right. yet. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then and you could see that when the horse lifts his head too much, see how in that moment the right hind leg is on the ground, but pretty far back so it's not in a position where it could actually flex mm -hmm. and support the weight that's partially why the head is up the horse is tossing the head right. here but yeah. it's a it's a illustrative example right. sometimes head tossing for a stride or mm -hmm. two could be uh, caused by a lack of connection from the rider's pelvis to the elbow and yes. then the contact goes up to the shoulder and gets stuck thank you i want to talk about yeah. the rider's yeah. influence here right. and um, how important of a role that is and how the, the head tossing mm -hmm. is a symptom of this lack of connection between the horse right. and the rider at that moment. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's very important that you have a good connection from your pelvis to your elbow. <laughs> One of our students calls it pelbo. <laughs> it's stuck in our horses. Yes. And uh, when you have a connection from your pelvis to your elbow, then you also have a connection from the hind legs to your pelvis, your hip joint, and on to the bit or the nose. It's the same thing with the bitless bridle, by the way. That is exactly the same, right? Yeah. And uh, so then your body weight helps to, tra uh, yeah, to transmit the contact and the aids into the hind legs. Whereas if your seat breaks up and then the contact goes up to the shoulder, then it usually gets stuck there. And then it cannot connect back to the hind legs in most cases. And then so the energy transmission is severed and the horses don't quite understand what that contact thing is supposed to be and they don't understand the rain aids. And as soon as you reestablish the contact between your pelvis and elbows, things start to make sense to the horse again and then they stop arguing with the rain and they come on the bit again. It's, it's really interesting sometimes. It's like day and night with some horses. And uh, see here now, the right hind leg now caught up, it's stepping a little bit more under the body, it's, um, spending more time in front of the vertical on the ground. 
which means more time to flex and support. And then as a result, the horse can relax the pole and he can lift the back and the withers again. Mm-hmm. And so then the horse is more on the bit. You can see the under neck muscles have relaxed. Yeah. They're no longer bracing. Right. Yeah, And that's sort of the common denominator in a way when the horse over elevates, there's always an element of the hind leg not flexing either because it's stepping short or it's stepping out to the side you know, or because the maybe the rider isn't connected enough between pelvis and elbow. And then when you see there, you can see how the hind leg touched down maybe in the vertical. So the foot is under the hip joint or just barely in front of that line. <clears throat> which means mm-hmm. there is almost no time for the for the right hind leg to support the body mass and flex. So mm-hmm. it hits the ground and pushes. And then if you skip that flexion and supporting phase, then the back drops and the head goes up. So basically the fix for that would be to engage the mm-hmm. hind legs more. Engagement is when the hind legs step under. Right. They can't flex if they don't step under enough. Right. So you want to, this is why the driving aids are important. Not that we drive all the time, mm-hmm. but that you, the driving mm-hmm. aids are continually inviting yeah. the hind legs to step underneath. Yeah. I mean, here is another classic case. See, as the horse approaches the long side, mm-hmm. see how the shoulder drifts out a little and then the, now the horse is crooked and the rider is using the inside rein to try to bring the forehand back on the line. And of course, it doesn't work. Right? It's like an instinctual reaction that almost everybody has. Like I, I made the mistake when I was young too. But if you can use your outside knee and rein to mm-hmm. nudge the seat. shoulder and the seat, you rotate yeah. your pelvis more so you nudge the horse's shoulders away from the wall, then, then he'll be straight and then he'll be round here. It's a little better. So she managed to get the, the shoulders a little more to the right in front of the right hind. And uh, the horse got rounder in here. Let's see if we can find out what, what happened here. Um, so here's still everything fairly good. Here, the, so you can see the head starting to lift. And yeah, the hind leg is behind the hip joint, like the hind foot is behind the vertical line of the hip joint, which means now it's pushing the, the supporting flexion phase is over and it's the pushing phase. And if there wasn't enough time for that right hind to flex and support the body mass, then yeah, the back goes down, the head goes up. In a way, the horse has to do that at that yeah, moment exactly. to recover and their balance. Yeah. And there, for some reason, the, the outside hind was pushing enough so the inside hind could step under the body and then it could... They had more time to hear it. See, the inside hind comes under the body enough and, and then the, the head goes down because now there was enough time for that inside hind to support the body mass. And there's a little in wobbliness here. There's a little in inconsistency. And in general, the horse is tossing the head there back yeah. and forth um, yeah. or up and down. <laughs> because you can see, actually, if you go back and show mm. the rider's seat, yeah, exactly. there's a, a lack, lack of connection, of connection yeah. between yeah. the the hands, the reins, and the seat. Yeah, there's a lot of space between the elbow and the pelvis, and then it's very difficult to create a good connect from your pelvis to the rein if, if the elbows and upper arms are too far away from the body. Most people can't do that. I mean, there's some, some talented riders who are able still to do that, but most riders can't because they're not strong enough in the abs. It takes, a, it takes a strong and educated yeah. seat right. to be able to withstand that gap. Right. So the less advanced rider yeah. really cannot afford to lose right. that connection between the yeah. elbow and the seat. Yeah. And here it looks to me like the shoulder wanted to stick to the wall a little bit. Here, the walls have a magnetic yeah. effect. And Very it's... typical yeah. problem that yeah. happens. And then as soon as you get the shoulder off the wall, it's good again, right? So the head drops because now she moved the shoulder a little to the right in front of the right hind leg and then um, and the balance is better. Let me just clarify. It's not that we're looking for the head to be down. Mm-hmm. That's not the point. We want the whole body working right. as a um, harmonious unit. Right. And the head and neck drop into a more relaxed mm-hmm. place when the whole body is working well. Yeah. It's not that we want the head and mm-hmm. neck down. If you did, then you would just pull them down. Yeah. That is not the point. Yeah, the uh, head and neck are balancing device for the horse, right? So the 
head and neck position reflects the balance of the horse in a lot of ways. So in and any time the balance changes, the horse has to move his head and neck a little bit, right? So that's why the, the posture has to change as you go from one gait to another, or as you go from a more collected gait to the medium or working or extended gait. And as you go from one line to another line or from single track to a lateral movement, the, the, every transition like that affects the balance. And so you'll see smaller or larger movements of the head and neck. And especially when the horse loses balance and gets crooked or falls on the forehand, you'll see a big movement of, of the head, right? Because now the horse is trying to recover his balance by tossing the head up or doing something with, with it, right? Of course, the head and neck position is much easier to see than balance and flexion of the hind legs or crookedness if it's subtle, right? So, uh, but it's it's a result of whatever is going on in the rest of the body, right? If the horse is balanced, if he's straight, chances are that the head and neck will be more or less in the place that everybody considers correct. <laughs> so, and it's a healthy yeah. place. Yeah, and then it's where a, it's, the muscles know. are working holistically mm-hmm. together right. as. A, a whole unit, a systemic unit. Right, yeah. exactly. And as the horse loses balance, as he gets crooked, or as the rider loses balance, right, then you'll see big movements of the horse's head and neck trying to regain balance, essentially. So now we're going to look at another one. Yes. This I found that interesting because you can see a little bit the uh, correlation between straightness and being through the back on the bit and go above the bit and uh, also tempo you'll you'll see it's it's an an interesting thing so here in the the horse has struggling with the turn so you can see how the horse is struggling with the balance in the turn the horse is leaning into the turn it could be that the horse is seeing or hearing something on the outside something it looks a little bit like the horse is trying to turn the head it could be a distraction but on the other hand if they lose balance they fall on the inside shoulder they kind of have to move the head to the outside as a counterweight mm-hmm. it's like when horses are loose and they gallop around a turn they always do that right they lean on the inside shoulder they counter bend because otherwise they'd fall over and there you see a little bit of that here. Unless they're in really, really good balance, in right. which case you don't see that. But that's the thing. When yeah. they fall ba- out of balance by falling yeah. onto the inside shoulder, they have to yeah. counterbalance themselves yeah. by bringing the head and neck to the outside. Yeah. And now you see here, the horse is still aligned pretty well from looking from behind. But as the turn begins, you can see the horse shifting the weight onto the inside shoulder and the belly starting to hang to the, the left a little bit. So it's one of those cases where the outside hind leg wasn't connected enough to the ground beforehand. And then that leads to a loss of balance and the horse falls on the inside shoulder. And here the horse speeds up, right? And yeah, if you have sensitive, hotter horses, that's often an issue that they just like to run. <laughs> And when they lose balance, they get faster. So that loss of balance in the corner probably led to the horse running away afterwards. And um, now when, when you freeze the frame, see how fast this goes? What I found interesting is that the hind leg comes pretty far under the body, right? Usually when horses invert, they don't step under enough. In this case, the inside hind is often quite well under the body, but it's so fast. The tempo is so fast that there's not enough time for the hind leg to flex the joints and support, right? So when the tempo is too fast and there's not enough time for the hind leg to go through the whole range of lifting off, reaching forward, touching down, flexing, pushing off, then the first thing that is skipped is the flexion phase. And then it's just swing forward, touch and push, swing forward, touch and push. And sometimes even the suspension phase is left out and it's just push, 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 you know, really fast. So when you try to stop the video, look at how far the hind leg comes under here. In this case, it's actually stepping a little short, probably because of that turn, the shoulder coming a little Mm -hmm. to the inside and kind of blocking the path of the inside. You can see the horse fell on the inside shoulder. Yeah, and then you you can see how the croup goes up because the hind leg is more or less extended. It's not flexing, it's just pushing. Mm -hmm. And if the croup goes up, the back and the withers go down. And if the back and withers go down, the head goes up. That's sort of the the mechanics of it. It's just physics, essentially, right? And uh, so here... The legs look good, right? But it it almost looks like the the horse retracts the hind leg a little before it hits the ground, which is really interesting. So now the hind leg 
is barely in front of the line of the hip, right? If you draw a vertical line down, the, the inside foot, hind foot is barely in front of that, which means that the window in which that hind leg can flex and support the weight is super short. So not really enough time to, to flex the joints, and learn, which is why these horses then often just hit the ground and push and they extend right away. And sort of like if you're going down a hill and you start to stumble, you're going to speed up to catch yourself. You're going to, going to take some quick steps. That's sort of what happens here. Mm -hmm. The horse has lost balance, so the horse gets faster and the horse pulls mm -hmm. further out of balance, gets faster, and this can downward spiral quite a bit. Yeah. So in here is just the moment when the hind leg touches down. Mm -hmm. If you draw a vertical line up, it's behind the rider's seat, really. In a, in a perfect world, that inside hind leg should touch down underneath the inside seat bound, if everything is in perfect balance. Which we're not there yet. Yeah, exactly. And this horse and, and rider are not yeah, there yet. It's yeah, just where yeah. they are. But the, the, the physics or the mechanics of mm -hmm. that is that the shorter the stride, the less time there is for the hind leg to flex the joints. And if the hind leg doesn't flex the joints, if it doesn't really support the body mass, then it sort of catapults the body mass forward and then the back is not supported enough and the back and the withers drop and the head goes up and, and so on. And plus, if the hind leg is sort of behind the rider's seat, then it's difficult for the rider's weight to really flex that hind leg. The more the hind leg steps under the center of gravity and under the seat, the more likely your weight aids are to flow through that hind leg into the ground. And if the hind leg is too far back and you try to sit down and use your weight as, as an aid to flex the hind leg, it will collapse the back underneath you. Then you can't reach the hind leg. The weight will not flow through the hind leg, but it will make the back literally collapse underneath you like a bridge that's too weak for the vehicle on the on the bridge, right? And here in these moments, you see how the hind leg reaches under the body quite well. Here it would be good, but the tempo is so fast that it's like not even a tenth of a second, and the, the hind leg is already vertically underneath uh, the hip. So there is physically not really enough time to flex the the hind leg. So if she could slow down the tempo, there would be a lot more time for the horse to flex his hind leg. And there would be a lot more time for her to apply the, the aids at the right moment, right? The slower the tempo, the easier it is to get the timing right, obviously, right? Which is a little bit of a chicken or egg situation yeah, because it's easier to get the half halt if the tempo isn't so fast, but yet you have to fix the fast tempo in yeah. order to be right. able to <laughs> right. get better timing. Yeah. So. Um, but you can really see here how the horse's balance, the, when the horse speeds up and gets fast, the horse's balance really affects everything mm -hmm. else. Right. Again, it yeah. comes down to balance. We're talking about the horse being above the bit, mm -hmm. on the bit, all of these things, but really it has everything to do with everything yeah. else. And the head and the neck mm -hmm. are really the mm -hmm. symptoms. They're the barometer. They tell right. us a little bit what's yeah. going on in the rest of the mm -hmm. horse. You know, it's like the old master said, balance and suppleness are the cornerstones of dressage, right? And you can see as the horse loses balance, like when it gets faster, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost, almost about to canter, yeah. exactly. So the, the horse has to brace in order not to fall down when they lose balance, just like we do too. If we lose balance, we have to hang on, right, with our hands and feet if you're on the horse and if you're on the ground and we're losing balance, we brace the whole body and the horses do the same thing, right? So, and then of course, if you have braced muscles like in the under neck and the pole because the horse has lost balance, then the energy of the hind legs won't be able to go through. Right? And also in order to, to stay upright, they often lift their, their head and neck, which then puts pressure on the horse's back, which is not supported by the hind legs. And then the back drops and it's like this feedback loop, you know, and sometimes it can be difficult to get out of a feedback loop mm. like that. And of course, here is a, this is a, like a show situation, so it's not much you can do. But in training, the best thing would be to walk, <laughs> regroup, rebalance, fix the seat, <laughs> yeah. rebalance the horse. Try to get, in general, if the half right. halt doesn't go through, mm. then doing a bigger transition, a down mm. transition into the walk or halt yeah. is in order. Yeah. And, uh, if the horse looks to the outside, it's always a sign typically that the horse is leaning along the inside shoulder, yeah. unless the rider is 
holding the outside rein too short. And here you see in the corner how the horse is leaning into the turn. That's what happens when you lose the your anchor in the outside hind. If that loses the connection to the ground and the weight, then the horse goes around a corner like a motorcycle, right? Then they lean in and then they can't bend because the rib cage hangs to the to the inside, right? And uh, um, yeah, you you'd have to slow down. You have to reconnect with the outside hind, and then you can engage the inside hind and then the horse will bend and then <laughs> the horse will be on the pit, right? That's like a chain reaction. Yeah, we can see how at the halt, the halt just escaped a little to the left, and which means the horse is then um, leaning on the right shoulder. And that's what you saw in that last long side. So that has to do with the crookedness of the horse. But, but yeah, see, that's what I, I was suspecting that if the horse looks to the outside, it tells me that he's probably leaning on the inside shoulder. And of course, if the horse is hollow left and stiff right. Actually, yeah. the, the rider's leaning quite a bit to the inside to also. Yeah. yeah. And so this exacerbates yeah. the situation. Yeah. Exactly. You know, but, the uh, horse cannot possibly be balanced if we're right. not balanced ourselves right. first. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the rider's seat plays a huge role. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. This is why we always work yeah. so much on the seat with our students. Yeah. yeah. Here it also looked like she had the outside hip a little too far back yeah. and uh, uh, the right hip too far back and the left hip too far forward, which then almost makes the horse move the croup to the left, right? If you look at that, how oh, the right hip comes back, the left hip is a little bit more forward, especially here, and that pushes the croup over to the left. And that could be her own pattern, which then transfers itself to the horse. And vice versa, sometimes the horse's crookedness then transfers itself to the rider. And then if they're crooked together, then you get results like that, where the horse is not aligned on the line, and then they have to brace, and then back drops, horse inverts, and comes above the bit, etc. It's, it's always a chain reaction, right? It's always located within a bigger pattern, whatever you see. Whatever detail you see is always part of a bigger picture. So we're going to look at one more. This one is actually bitless because we want to really drive home the point. It's turved above the bit, behind the bit, mm -hmm. on the bit, but the bit has very little to do with it. Yeah. You know, this all happens even with bitless riding. So let's take a look at this one. Yeah, it's always balance and suppleness, mm -hmm. how all the body parts work together. And whether you're riding with a bit or without a bit, it really makes no difference in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so here you, you see the horse's nose um, poking out and, and the head lifting too much. And here, this is a, it's a very common thing you see. I mean, it looks like the rider sits down a little too far back in the saddle, which puts a lot of pressure on the loins of the horse, which then typically makes them drop the back and invert. And it also looks like um, there's not enough connection from the back muscles or the pelvis to the elbows yeah. of the rider. This is a really good illustration yeah. of this lack yeah. of connection yeah. and how a couple of adjustments to the rider's yeah. seat and a little bit in what she's doing and it would help mm, the, yeah. the pony immensely. Yeah. And it's a, a bit of a chain reaction in the rider's body too, right? If you sit down a little too far back, then... You have too much weight on the seat bones and the, it's a small area right, well, that supports your entire weight. It, it's not spread out around the ribcage. It usually also brings the knees up and forward and it brings the lower legs off the horse and, and forward. And um, when the pelvis of the rider has a tendency to go back, then typically the, the hands have a tendency to go back as well. Uh, whereas if you bring your pelvis forward between your elbows, then your hands will have a more forward giving kind of tendency. You know, so and then if you have a bit of a backward traction on on the reins, the horse will brace the underneck and the pole against uh, against that traction on the yes. rein. And this happens so easily because riders yeah. think, oh, I need to pull the head down. I need to pull the yeah. nose in. Yeah. So they have this desire mm -hmm to use the hands and reins to, to yeah. pull the head and neck in. Yeah. But this is actually not what you want to do. Yeah. This won't yeah. actually help you. Yeah. And you, you can see that uh, sometimes the, the reins are almost a little too loose. Right? Um, sometimes there's a backward traction on it. You can sometimes see the hands moving back. 
And so there, there is no energy recycling through the rains back to the to the hind legs, and that that's in this case um, caused by the wider seed, more or less. And uh, yeah, with the yeah, pelvis moving forward between the elbows, knees sinking a little bit more, like so that you get the feeling that you're kneeling. And with the lower legs a little back, because you know you, f you can flex your knees a little bit more, then your seat becomes better balanced, more independent, more stable, and then the horse will be able to lift the back and come on the bit, on the bit without a bit. <laughs> so, and yeah, it's, yeah, funny thing is that that uh, when you ride bitless and the horse is going well on the bit, <laughs> mm -hmm. then they can foam in front, uh, get a little foam around the, the lips, right? yeah, even though they have nothing in their mouths, right? So, um, it, Traditionally, it was always said, well, when they're mouthing the bit and so on, that they, they create saliva and then, yeah, you have a little bit of foam around the mouth. But you have that without anything in the mouth as well. With a bitless mm -hmm. bridle, you can get that too, that there's a little foam just because... Uh, they're working correctly. Yeah, they're working correctly. And it's not the excessive salivating. Right. It's just yeah. the gentle foaming yeah. that happens yeah. because the whole system of the body of the horse is yeah. working yeah. together. It's working well. Yeah, exactly. The halt, you saw a little bit of this crookedness that the, the shoulders moved a little bit to the right. So that, of course, is especially visible when you look from the front, but it's something that's always going on a little bit. So there's always a little bit of a crookedness there, which will affect the rein contact. Some horses are very sensitive if the shoulders are just a hair off to one side and the, the hind leg of the hollow side is not quite under the body and then they drop the back and they invert. And as soon as you line up the, the shoulders in front of that hind leg of the hollow side, the horse lifts the back and drops the pole. Some horses are super sensitive to that. Some yeah. horses are super sensitive to that pelvis elbow connection in the rider. And if, yeah. if you don't have it, they start tossing their head and arguing with the reins. As soon as you create that connection, they're happy. Actually, you can see that with the yeah. horse that was tossing its head yeah. a few videos back. Yeah. You yeah. know, every time the mm. rider lost that connection, yeah. it was the, had to do with the hind leg. But the hind leg has to do with the pelbow mm. and vice versa. Right. And this pelbow that we mm. call it, the pelvis mm. and elbow mm. connection, every time the rider lost that and got stiff with yeah. their arms, the horse started mm. tossing the head as a result. Yeah. When you have too much weight on your seat bones and you're sitting a little far back in the saddle, that can actually prevent the hind leg from coming under because you're essentially pushing the back down a little bit. And when mm. the back is dropped, the hind legs don't have space to come under here. You see it a little bit. The right hind leg is stepping a little bit short and that can be caused by the seat. You see here, same, same thing, the left hind leg stepping a little short and the rider looks like she has all her weight on her seat bones. And it's taught in a lot of places, but if you think in terms of physics, a small support base means you have many pounds in a very small area in terms of square inches or square centimeters. Whereas if you spread the weight out over the yeah. whole rib cage down to the point where the ribs are vertical, then same amount of weight, much bigger area. That means the pressure is a lot smaller in terms of pounds or kilograms per square inch or square centimeter. And for a lot of horses, that makes a difference. You know, a lot of horses, when you spread the weight out, they go on the bit much more easily and they lift the back and they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're happy. And if, if you dig your seat bones in a little bit or you concentrate your entire weight under your seat bones and they often drop the back and the head goes up and then the energy transmission is, is disrupted. Yeah, here you can see a little bit the seat coming down a little far back and then you, you see how the hind legs now are unable to step under. And if the hind leg is long out behind, then the neck is usually stretched out in front. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as the hind leg comes under, the horse gets shorter from behind by stepping under and flexing, <laughs> then the neck will get rounder and elevate a little bit, and then the nose doesn't stick out as far. And I just want to drive home mm -hmm. why this is so important. Mm -hmm. Because we can see here the majority of the horse's weight is on the front legs, mm -hmm. and the front legs are not made to bear mm -hmm. weight in motion. The hind legs, because they can bend, because the joints, they alternate in angle, they can bear weight and bend. And so they're made to flex and support the body mass of the horse. What happens when a horse goes around through his life on the forehand, he'll become unsound in the front legs. And one of the core aims that we have in dressage is to 
of course, we want to make a nice relationship with our horse and all of this, but it's also to help the horse become sounder and stay sounder. And in order to do that, we have to transfer the weight off of the forehand and onto the hind legs. So this is why the contact is so relevant because it impacts the balance of the horse and vice versa, mm -hmm. as you can yeah. see. Yeah. So I hope that we were able to show you a little bit that being on the bit, above the bit, behind the bit, etc., is not just about the head and neck position of the horse, but not about the or, or a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that's the funny thing, right? It's yeah. the old, old terminology. But yeah, everything the horse does is always located inside a bigger pattern that involves the entire body. So you always have to look at what the entire body is doing. You have to look at how energy is transmitted, how it flows through the body, if it gets blocked somewhere by a muscle blockage or if it exits the body through a false bend. Yeah. So that's why you have to look at whether the hind legs are stepping under the body, whether they're flexing, you know, or whether they're pushing the croup up or... You know, look at whether the horse is tracking straight, you know, along the line or if, if the horse is crooked. Mm -hmm. We look at the lateral yeah, balance, the exactly. longitudinal balance. Yeah. All of these factors yes. play in. I, exactly. And the, the head and neck position is, is the result really of the balance and the mm -hmm. straightness and the suppleness of the horse. So the head and neck are balancing device. So their position reflects the, the balance of the whole horse. And if the balance changes, the head and neck position changes a little bit. And, Unfortunately, judges often like it when the head and neck stays the same, no matter what the horse does. And so the people who, who train the horses to keep the head always in the same place, they typically sever the connection from the uh, torso to the, to the neck. Because then the neck can just hang out and stay around, whatever, and it doesn't matter if the horse is crooked or balanced or which gait they're riding. But if the horse is really connected back to front, you will see the head and neck position change every time the balance changes. And it's it's necessary. It's not a bad thing. It, you know, Of course, the better the balance, the more consistent the balance, the more consistent the head and neck position is. Now, if you sever the connection and you make the horse keep his neck in a certain mm. place, no matter what the rest is doing, then it's cheating. <laughs> then it's not really honest. You know. Which brings me to one more point that I wanted to talk about really briefly is why all of these auxiliary devices <laughs> are not beneficial for the horse. For example, the draw reins that are hooked up to just pull the horse's head down. All these lunging devices like the, what are they, the Pessoa? There's a whole, Chambon, there's a whole bunch of the martingales, um, German martingales that also use leverage to pull the horse's head down. It's addressing the head and neck. And the head and neck are not the issue. They're not the problem the problem yeah. is somewhere else yeah the head and neck is the, the consequence it's not the mm -hmm. cause right so they're the, the symptom and and uh, see it's like um when you have a fever you're sticking the thermometer in cold water to bring the fever down when that's the thermometer is not the mm -hmm. problem okay. the problem is the fever well, the problem here is that the hind legs are not coming under the back is not coming mm -hmm. up and through the energy is not coming through the energy is not being recycled it's one of these factors mm -hmm. that's affecting the balance of the horse mm -hmm. and we're seeing it with right. the head coming above a bit yeah. and furthermore i just wanted to mention also that when you use these devices it actually does what he was talking about which is disconnects your ability to be able to actually positively influence mm -hmm. the rest of the horse so it not only addresses the symptom but it actually makes the problem worse so don't mm -hmm. do it <laughs> so there we go. That's day one above the bit. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a Q&A tonight. Well, it's nighttime for us, so it may be a different time of day for you. We'd love to see you there. And day two tomorrow will be on behind the bit, which again is not necessarily about the bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so behind the vertical, we're going to get into some of the controversy and stuff around that. So make sure you show up for day two. Yep. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.